into the real market with Chris Rising. I'm excited today to have a couple of guys who started a company in 2006, and this thing has grown. And they're not just a couple of friends, they're brothers. So I'm excited to have Matt and Mike Pestronk from Post Brothers out of the Philly area, but really on the Eastern Seaboard, joining the real market. So gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, as I kind of mentioned before we started, I, I don't think I've interviewed two people at once, much less two brothers at once. So I'm going to kind of leave it up to you guys who decide to fight over who gets to answer most of the questions. But uh, why don't, uh, Matt, just uh, since you're the older brother, why don't you give us a little bit about Post Brothers and, and about what led you to it? And then we'll have your brother Mike talk. Sure. So Post Brothers was started by my brother and I in 2006 with the idea of buying and renovating apartment buildings that were older in infill locations um, in Philadelphia, which was a novel business plan at the time. Now it sounds very prosaic. So the business has morphed over time from doing that to doing major adaptive reuse and large scale ground up projects. At any given time, we've got probably a couple thousand units under construction, the same in pre-development and a couple thousand units stabilized kind of one to two billion in each area at any time. And um, what led us to doing it was um, we were already, we got jobs in real estate out of college and it became something interesting. And we were both um, working for other people doing things. I was a commercial mortgage broker and uh, my brother was doing asset management and development for another developer in Philadelphia. And we sort of had an idea that we wanted to start the business maybe over 20 or wait, wait, 25 years ago, but it took some time to get to the point to actually get it started successfully to be able to stay in business. So that, that was what we, we, we started what is now Post Brothers in 2006. So Mike, how did that, when, when Matt came to you and he's been doing this uh, mortgage brokerage business, he knows very well things like guarantees and all that kind of stuff. And what made you go from saying, yeah, I like working for somebody being an asset manager to say, no, I'm going to go in and be a principal with my brother. I mean, that's got to be well, a think, little bit I daunting. Think, sure. Well, I think we're just probably somewhat naturally inclined to just be uh, entrepreneurial. But um, I had been working for a multifamily developer who was doing um, you know, relatively small scale student housing in uh, kind of emerging, emerging neighborhoods. And so I, my... Uh, the the job I was doing, I got exposed to um, a lot. I worked closely with the principals and, you know, I would do things like help lease apartments and oversee renovations, but also like cold call widows and ask to buy the building and ask them to hold paper also, you know, when buying the building. And so, um, and I, you know, I just, they kind of like gave me a script and I was like 21, I didn't, you know, or didn't, you know, I mean, I, you know, I came to understand it. And, and so, you know, came, I worked there for a while and it was, it was a great experience and, and I worked, um, you know, and, and so I've been doing that and Matt had been doing, uh, you know, commercial lease brokerage and then through that, you know, had been exposed to investment sales and we both kind of came to understand the business of, hey, you know, you, you, you of how it works, you buy a piece of real estate, you can borrow some money, you can raise some money and, and you say, you know what you're doing and you have this idea and hopefully, you know, and it, it should work out. and. Um, yeah, so so after a couple of years of, of experience each, we we try actually we tried after we were both in the business for maybe only a year or two, as Matt alluded to, that didn't really take off. Then we both went to work for other. I went to work for two other developers after that. Matt uh, got into um, commercial mortgage brokerage, and uh, then several years later is when we kind of reformed and and got it off the ground. Matt, why on earth in 2006, I remember it very well. If you're a mortgage broker, you're making pretty damn good money back then. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the I, ones, I, you know, they weren't asking for a whole lot of, uh, it was very covenant light. Was that the why you decided with your first deal was a good time because it was a, it was just liquidity in the, in the yes. lending market or yeah. did you find a deal? It was, what you it guys was do? sure. So we were, we were, we were, we, the the source of liquidity, the, the first source of asset liquidity for pursuit capital that we were, we were able to generate was from the investments Mike had made, like sort of sweat, you know, small pieces of promoted interest Mike made for himself on those projects, plus the money I was making as a mortgage broker. 
which was, you know, I thought that good times were going to go on forever, but we were focused. I was financing what I would say would be like kind of mid-market properties for compared to what we're doing today, but like, you know, 30 or $40 million shopping centers or suburban office parks. And we weren't trying to buy properties like that. We were trying to buy like two or $3 million apartment houses. Mm-hmm. So the scale of, you know, I, I knew that starting small was the right way to do it was the only, it seemed, it seemed overly ambitious and likely to fail to start with something that, you know, like a trying to develop or buy a $40 million asset when you never owned anything before as a sponsor seemed like a ridiculous and overly ambitious trajectory to try to follow, to try to get into. We didn't try to do a project like that first, but I'd say we did a, we bought a 10 unit building, then a 50 unit, then a 90 unit building. Then we tried to buy a 200 unit building that was like, um, going to be a $35 million project. And then we had term sheets signed with, I'll never forget this. We had term sheets signed with cat with like Lehman, Wachovia, Catmark and Leg Mason. And not only did they all just drop the term sheets, they all went out of business. It wasn't like, sorry, we can't honor your deal. Like, sorry, we're, 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 we're we need to recapitalize know. ourselves. <laughs> and so that was that was a valuable lesson in lost pursuit costs and trying to chase a, an opportunity in a in a horrible and declining market. Um, so actually, by at that time, we'd bought four small apartment house properties, and then we were trying to do something much larger, and that didn't work, and the, and the, and the market was was bad. So um, we got through the financial crisis. This is like not the these aren't. The, Nothing bad happened to us during the financial crisis. All of our properties, the worst investments we made at that time, we broke even. We had to um, get fixed rate financing in like 2009 because the community banks we borrowed from said, you have to pay us off. Like we're going to, only way we're going to keep funding these draws on your construction loan is if you agree to pay us off as soon as you have your 95% or else we'll accelerate the loan. And we didn't really have any choices but to agree unfortunately at the time and so we wound up financing what were well executed developments into like a 6.7 percent interest rate environment at the end of 2006 and then instead of tripling our equity when we sold those properties the prepayment penalties took like a turn and a half of one of what would have been the best deals of the equity so instead of getting right close to a triple in we bought one, you know, in 07, 08, we were selling those properties through like 13, 14. Um, you know, most of them had very expensive fixed rate financing that reflected itself in the price. But that was the worst thing that happened to us. We, we made money on all of them. We didn't make as much as we should have. But we, when the world started to normalize, we didn't really have any, like, we didn't have, we didn't have any, you know, issues with... Yeah projects that had gone bad and that was a good position i mean a very good position and, and i think you're in the business long enough you realize singles are good too <laughs> you know, when you're young you think yeah. everything's supposed to be a triple or a home run or a grand slam but but there's so many things out of your control when you guys started did you think about we need to have a fee business with this did you start out doing property management or did you take the mode of we want to be very you know, employee light and will third party all that. Neither. We wanted to be vertically integrated to make the equity investments profitable. Apartment management um, doesn't, third party apartment management is a low margin business. And we looked at it a lot and we wouldn't, we actually don't, it's, it's, it's when you look at invested time of high level employees, forget about our own time. Um, of sort of principles of our company, property management is not a winning business. In commercial real estate, when especially when you can do the leasing and the property management, and you, you know, if you have an office building with two leases rolling a year, property management can be have high margins. In commercial real estate with or residential with 40 or 50 percent of the free of the apartments, assuming you're a market rate building, turning over every year if it's a class A building and you built it and you somebody moving in and out 
every other day, it's not a, it's yeah. not a, it's yeah. So we didn't, we didn't really, that wasn't, that wasn't really an option for us. And we could have been, we could have focused more on a fee development model. Um, and that means different things to different people, but basically you don't, you don't even, you don't take pursuit risk. You build for on the East coast. It means maybe you do affordable, you build for institutions, you respond to RFPs. Um, that was, that was something we looked at, but we didn't have the track record when capital was, um, when capital was an issue, it was a real constraint for us. We didn't have a track record yeah. to be able to win those RFPs. And now that's just, we, we've, we've never done it. So now there's to Chris, time. And, you could get to a yeah. point, unless some major recession happens, it's, there's not the time, right? Right. Exactly. I'd say we went from the, the model for us was because I worked, I actually stayed as a mortgage broker after the financial crisis because I told, so I was making an, you know, a lot of money in 2006 for somebody with no discernible skills. And so, <laughs> so I told my wife that my, my to be wife at the time that I was going to quit what I was doing. I was working for, you know, Ackman Ziff in New York, which is a well-known successful right. company. No, and, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. So the, I, Simon's I a good making, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it was a great. It was a great place to learn a lot of things. Yeah. And I told her before the financial crisis happened, I'm going to quit and just go work with my brother. And we had like one 10 unit building at the time. She's like, "What? What is? Do you have a brain?" She's like, "Why would you do that? You can't make like enough. Like, how much money does Post, which is you know, the company, yeah. how much does Post make? I'm like, it makes three percent of the rent roll of a hundred thousand dollars." <laughs> She goes a month. No, I go a year. A year. <laughs> it's three thousand dollars a year. And so I mean, that was no move out costs too, right? <laughs> right, right. So, so I realized um, we never we started the business, and I didn't work in the business or draw a salary from the business until about eleven years ago. And a lot of people, I don't know, it's not something I, I'm. It, it, I think it was a smart thing. It's not something I'm ashamed of that I wasn't all in in the beginning. I was all in on two things. I had my income declined by 90% from 06 to 09. I got married, had a mortgage, had a pregnant wife in 2009 and started a business. So it's not like I wasn't all in on it, on everything. <laughs> it was just unfortunate timing. And so then um, I didn't really work at the company. I didn't, I didn't spend a hundred percent of my daily time at the company until we had a couple institutional scale projects underway because I couldn't pay myself a salary um, enough. I couldn't pay myself. We couldn't pay me enough to live on. And it was more important to hire other people than me um, yeah. to build out the roots of the, what is the, you know, the infrastructure of the core of the company today. Well, you know, that the story is, is, is unique as what, what, what you went through, but I don't think it's unique to entrepreneurs. I think, um, I think I kind of went through a few years before that, the same kind of thing. My fiance at the time, I said, I'm leaving Cushman and Wakefield and, you know, what are you doing? Mike, what, 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 how did it make you feel though that, you know, you're sitting there starting this business with your brother and he's got to put food on the table and work a lot of hours and something that isn't directly related to the business you guys had started? Uh, I don't know. I think, I think we were, we were pretty much aligned. Um, you know, we spending a lot of time on the business. We were getting done um, what we needed to get done. And in you know, that period, that was like 2009. So there wasn't a lot, you know, for Matt. There, there, it's not like, you know, there were a ton of new transactions going on, a ton of new financings going on. Um, you know, we were just kind of finishing a few projects and renting them. And there wasn't a ton going on in the business at that point. And so, you know, just, it, it made sense. We were, um, you know, we were, we were aligned in, in what we were doing and, um, you know, we, we kind of just kept our heads down. And then in really in April, 2011, we bought our first institutional. Really no, in December, company. December, 2010. And, yeah, I guess you're right. And by April, I think by April 11, I think is when Matt, uh, really started full-time if I recall yeah I was kind of phasing myself out of the other job for a year yeah, right. or two also right well how did right. you all decide who was going to be CEO and who's going to be president why why didn't you go with co-presidents I mean 
did you what what how did you guys I, that's a horrible way to ask the question how did you look at all the res- <laughs> roles and responsibilities and decide i'm going to take these and mike's going to take these how did that we, come we about? are we are we are wrestling um <laughs> So, um, so wait, I, CEO is higher than president. That would imply that you won. That's definitely, <laughs> not, not, none of that is what happened. And I'm not saying he couldn't beat me in arm wrestling. <laughs> um, no, just, just the, the way the business evolves. Um, you know, I, I just kind of the, 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 the daily, you know, executive kind of functions are just, you know, more became the things I did. And um, I don't know, just, it just kind of, we have totally did way. how we divide it so the titles were just like not not something that we really thought about it was it was just he was doing it full time first right so he should get the, I, I got, whatever title he wants I, I basically i was in charge of making the first set of business cards and so i just <laughs> I <got to> <laughs> that's right. usually how these things play out i find in all, all my discussions over the years so let me but ask the, you this because the, i what i found unique about what you all got yourselves into was you dove head into really complicated adapter for use, historic kind of issues. I mean, that you really built a name along the Eastern Seaboard doing that. What was appealing about doing that? Was it the opportunity or, a, and then you created the strategy or was it a strategy and then you found the opportunity? No, so, 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 so no. So backing up, how we divided responsibilities in the business were, was, was, was really frictionless. We were just good at entirely different things and we enjoy entirely different things. And so he, you know, Mike deals with, Mike likes, you know, the creative process of designing and developing and building a building. And, you know, I tend to, to be, you know, I, I like tr- transactions and I, you know, numbers, talking about numbers are something that I find exciting. And not that, not that, you know, both of us have the ability to be, um, you know, redundant to what the other person is doing, but we don't really do that at all because just when you have a family business and you, I mean, it's, it's a family business, you, you know, and it's the same generation. If you have an argument, you know, that can get, it can get personal kind of fast. And if you, so if you don't have the same responsibilities, and almost all the time, you never do a project if the other one doesn't want to do it. I can't say we've never done it. But the one thing is when we both haven't agreed, they've not been our best projects. Yeah. But, and there hasn't been many of those. Um, so, so how we got into what we were doing, which was idiosyncratic and complicated, was um, say after the financial crisis, ground up construction, which is something that we pivoted into later, didn't really pencil in a lot of the East Coast markets. Construction costs were were pretty high. There was not a lot, there's n- not been a lot of land available in a lot of these places over time. And so what there was more of was underinvested, you know, historical, historic and, you know, old buildings. So unlike most people who start as, de- unlike most developers who start who you see, you know, they're building a 500 unit or an 800 unit ground up project, which we're doing plenty of that now. They didn't, we didn't start doing that because um, most people, when they think of real estate development, that's what they think of. Development in Philadelphia and probably Washington DC and, and uh, you know, in this, in the mid Atlantic region was entirely building renovations because residential rents really weren't high enough to support the costs of construction. Um, you know, around, around right after the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you when you tell me the first deal that the two of you looked at each other, sounds like is around 2010, 2011, but usually the first deal doesn't give you the confidence. It's kind of like we got the first deal done that I think we have real business that I can. And then what was the next deal? Cause that, what I found in my business career is you get one that gives you a life and then you get one that says I can make this a career. <laughs> so how that was describe those deals. The, sure. So the first one was was a building we still we still own both of those buildings. First one became a building called Gold Tax. The second one became a building called Rittenhouse Hill. Mike, you want to you how you you jump in with the first yeah, one? Start, I'll, I'll I'll jump in when you go ahead. Okay. So the first one was um a, like a hundred and thirty thousand foot gross 
square foot, 130,000 gross square foot building that was a vertical loft textile manufacturing building, like 11 stories with uh, concrete, uh, you know, 12 to 14 foot wind uh, ceiling heights and, you know, floor, nearly floor to ceiling windows, except they were all like blown out and shattered and boarded up. And it was like on the edge of downtown Philadelphia. And, you know, the world was full of distressed opportunity then. And so we, um, we, we were aware this was available and the guys who'd been in it before were probably in it for around 16 million. They owed around 10. And this bank was, um, this bank was a, a local bank in Philadelphia had this loan on their books and the bank was probably not in great shape. And they, they had a personal guarantee from the borrower and they said, we said to them, look, we don't really, we know the, we know who the borrowers are like, we don't, we'll give you guys $5 million as a loan payoff. If you can give us, get us the deed. And then um, they said, that's fine. But the borrower has a personal guarantee. And we reached out to the borrower's attorney and said, just settle the guarantee with the bank as though you're paying it and we'll pay for it. So it's just part of the price of the building. Yeah. They did that. I think we got the building for five or five and a half million dollars. I think it was 4.5 plus 500. Plus they hadn't paid, so they were like, you know, $800,000 of unpaid expenses from their, you know, derelict ownership. And um, we then decided we were going to make it a 163 unit building, which is an interesting scale, but kind of subscale for institutional. Mm -hmm. So um, then th there was definitely a lot of distressed opportunity in the market at that time. And then we, uh, we bought another building, which is 650 unit uh, a residential tower from LNR who was trying to, well, really from a borrower who LNR was foreclosing on. It was a special, it was a loan was in special servicing. And um, we figured out something that no one else figured out, which was that the borrower, LNR had tried to put a receiver in and they tried to do it through the judicial foreclosure process. And they had to go to trial to get the receiver, which is unusual because the borrower, we got, I just got all of the, I mean, it was pre, before a lot of these things were digitized. I just got the court files and I gave a set to my attorney and I was like a quarter of the way reading through them and thinking like, this is really strange. And I was starting to have an idea of what was going on. My attorney called me, he said, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? He said, the borrower doesn't deny he, he defaulted on the mortgage. He, he says that LNR doesn't own the mortgage. And they were suing in like the, a very low, LNR made a mistake. They were suing in, in, in a low level court in Philadelphia, not, not even a commercial court. Like the case before the foreclosure complaint was about like, um, you know, a traffic, like a, yeah. like, um, meeting a traffic violation, but like a, a case of under a hundred thousand dollars being contested. Yeah. And so LNR had a document that said that they own the mortgage. It was called an omnibus assignment agreement, yeah. meaning that the loan had passed through multiple hands and ultimately to wind up in a securitization trust, which is common practice, except the borrower's attorney just destroyed LNR's attorney in court and was like, would you expect us to give up our equitable rights to this property because you have this crazy document? We, How could that document even be? We didn't even sign it. And we're the borrower. And of course, knowing how those things work, you know that the judge in Philadelphia bought that hook, line, and sinker, and the borrower was totally in the wrong. Like, was, yeah. like all the, the facts weren't really in their favor in reality. So we went to the borrower and put the property under contract. And we said, you know, like you owed 60 with default interest. And you actually, actually had a personal guarantee, which there were no personal guarantees on CMBS loans then or now. Yeah. And that just tells you what a mess of a situation the property was when they even got the loan. So we said, we'll get you off your guarantee. We'll give you a consulting fee for helping us figure this out. And we'll pay off LNR. And as long as you get we're not going to come up with a total consideration of more than like 34 million. And we knew that other people were trying to buy the property from LNR because LNR is sort of like 
said to the market they could do a short sale, but they couldn't. They weren't in a position to do it because they didn't have the foreclosure judgment. So, <laughs> so we were just like, all right, we showed up with a contract and no one had ever heard of us. So I called LNR and I said, I have a contract. I'm prepared to close on this property. And they knew they had a problem. It was in like the special, special assets group. Yeah. And so I said, I know I'm paying the most because this, there's a property sale broker and what he thought you were going to get, I'm paying a dollar more than anyone else. And, <laughs> and they were like, uh, so then the president of LNR at the time called me, he's like, who the hell are you? Tell me what's going on. And I just told him like, this is what <laughs> is going on. I'm like, you, we're not, you're not any worse off because we're buying this. And I said, we will close right now. We had some- Do you have we, a capital partner? Like a, yeah. like a private equity real estate partner? No, a family, a family office who we're still family partners office. with. Better. Yeah. And so, so, you know, it, it was, it was such a unique situation. You need, you needed somebody who was like one G in terms of ma making money and not afraid of risk. He agreed with us. And LNR said, I said, I'll close right now. And they said, are you, you're, you're in, are you kidding? And I'm like, no, send me a settlement sheet. Like settle with the borrower, send us a settlement sheet. Let's go. And we That's closed cool. like one day later. Well, the, the great thing is, Matt, when I hear you talk, it reminds me a lot of my partner, Scott McMullen, who was at HFF and opened up the West Coast and all that. And he gets he starts talking about things exactly like you do. Uh, we were getting in with the special servicer. We we're doing this. We're doing that, which I do. I have to by default. But I also spend a lot more time, sounds like where Mike does, where I'm like saying, okay, yeah, this thing is blown out. And we've got, you know, people smoking crack on the corner and this, but I have these 18 reasons why everyone's going to love this thing. And we're going to put these, as you can see behind us, is one of the buildings we did. I got to imagine as you're talking in these great ways about how you get in to buy the building, Mike's sitting here at some point has to say, I, I believe in the vision. So Mike, what was the vision on these two properties? They sound like they were great, but all of this sounds great. If you still buy it at the wrong basis because the vision doesn't work, then the basis is still wrong. So what made you feel comfortable that you could turn it into something that took, takes a great deal into a home run? Sure. Well, there, there are two pretty different properties. So the first one was this 10 story, uh, you know, vertical concrete manufacturing building on the edge of downtown Philadelphia. And it was, that, that's it was a lot of connotations out there that Unless you're it's from just, Philadelphia, I don't know what it, it means, but if I say it looks like it looked like LA, people get scared. <laughs> it looked like something like like in, in Gotham City, like a few blocks outside of downtown where the bad guys would hang out inside and like it was it was it was it was a little rough. Um it was the blighting and, factor not, of not the neighborhood. Interrupt a little bit too much on my own stuff, but the building we're we're in right here is where they did the Wall Street scene in the Batman movie with the guy uh with the yeah. Joker, you know, the when it was Wall yeah. Street. We bought it, and unfortunately, it, the neighborhood hasn't improved like it sounds like it did around. Yeah, no, and, and this neighborhood similar. And so, I mean, actually, the the, sure. the Broadway Trade Center right across, like right across from you. If, if you've been inside upstairs, there, um, that you know, that's what it was like. It was just a concrete shell. Yeah. Um, there are a few. You know, there's an attic or two living there, and so anyway, that one though, despite this description, um, felt like a no brainer to us because it was the only. B building of a some of a somewhat decent scale that was a loft style building yeah. um that close to downtown that was frankly that was undeveloped i mean b basically any any you know going from a radius from the core of downtown um you know most buildings like this within a radius had been or every building within a radius of this had been you know redeveloped and, and, and the neighborhood gentrified and this was a block or two past that and just kind of the next obvious big building um so that you know that one was and, and then from the building physical perspective i mean it was it was just, it was relatively easy to understand it was just a concrete shell we weren't going to reuse anything we had to patch some concrete you know we did some basic structural testing to make sure it was um you know, a good a good starting point and it was a pretty easy building to understand from an adaptive reuse standpoint it was pretty narrow um it, it uh i think it's wide which is you know, only a little bit wider than you would make a purpose-built residential building today. So it was pretty easy um, from a usability standpoint. And, and was the vision that you were going to sell 
more of a box and let the owner develop the interior out or did you rentals, have a vision? All right. All right, just rentals, just rentals. So you had you you had to have the vision of okay, that's where the bathroom's gonna go, and that's where the sink's gonna go, and the kitchen. And oh yeah, yeah, no, we did. I mean, we did we did, we did full layouts. I mean, these had really cool, you know, fifteen foot ceilings. So we wanted to make these with this loft space. We got we like invented and got custom manufactured like a pull down like hydraulic stair. I mean, we made beautiful apartments. They were at the time, you know, like. Like any new building is, you know, class A. Nobody really builds new yeah. class B housing. It was, it was, it was the best building in the city, um, and it, it's still a really nice units ten plus years later. Um, and it had, by the time, it was the first like cool rooftop pool in the city. Now you know there's twenty five buildings probably, but you know, t eleven years ago that was n nobody had done that yet. Um, and so that, you know, that, 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 that was great. Um, you know, like, like where you are though, that frankly, that neighborhood hasn't evolved as much as some other, um, neighborhoods where we've developed, it's been a little disappointing and, and it's, you know, 10 years ago or more, we were very focused on emerging neighborhoods. Yeah. Today we're focused on locations with adjoining multi-million dollar for sale housing um I get it. you know I get it. much more let's locations. talk a little bit about the risk because i think anybody who listens to my podcast is, is usually an entrepreneur who's out there saying you know i want to do something like this i mean that's a big heavy lift that you guys took on how did you look at it from a construction standpoint from a technology standpoint how did you control the risk of construction not exploding on you and how did you oversee it day to day so that you came reasonably within budget and on time and all those kind of things? Did you use technology? Did you use lots of people? Did you two didn't sleep for, you know, 12 or 18 months? Probably both. Well, yeah. well I, first, why is your starting assumption that it didn't blow up? But um, no, <laughs> the, the, pro the project was... Um, I like to think other people can do things on time and on budget when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> um, that that is, So there's a, a, a few parts to that. Um, one, in the, in the planning phases... Um, we, we had done some really gnarly projects, um, in terms of, you know, full gut renovations, adaptive reuse. We had done, you know, five of the kind of mid-scale projects that we described before that, including, you know, I mean, just com complete gut renovations with, with uneven floors, re-leveling floors, hundred percent new systems and, you know, new envelopes and foundation reinforcements and things. So, so from a construction standpoint, we were we were pretty confident um, with what it took. And technology-wise, um, we thought um, we we, hi we hired a big uh, architecture firm because I wanted uh, I was super technology focused. And you know, eleven years ago, Revit was like a new thing, and 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 three yeah. D plans were a new thing. I really wanted somebody who could like use it and, and actually do it. And our because. A lot of the architects at that time weren't even using it, and, and it was it was over their heads. And even today, I'm still waiting for uh, somebody who can actually use it effectively. But anyway, we had this idea to, to, to use Rabbit, and at the time, uh, and frankly, you know, in retrospect, none of the we weren't able to get the promised benefits out of it 11 years ago because none of the subs could use it. Um, yeah. you know, none of the subs could work in 3D, and um, but. Um, Going back to the construction, so in our five projects before that, we had uh, come to act as our own general contractor, and it wasn't really to generate a profit, but because in the first, on every project, frankly, we went to bid out the work to a general contractor and weren't happy with the bids. And, uh, you know, the general contracting community in Philadelphia was still is relatively small and um, parochial, maybe closed. for lack of a better way, put closed. Yeah. And so, um, we, you know, kind of defaulted in becoming our own general contract. And we did that on our first five projects and probably, I don't know, 30 or $40 million of, of work. And then those, that was all outside of the core of downtown. We started this project in the core of downtown. And before that, we had had some interactions with the building trade unions. You know, they had come to knock on the door of our project and ask if, you know, we were, you know, using union labor. And I said, no, what are you talking about? And then they didn't really bother us in the suburbs. But then we started the city project and um, 
we you know went to begin work in kind of a normal way and we bid it to union contractors and non-union contractors and we hired a mix of union and non-union contractors as is kind of normal and uh business you know, like it made just made, <laughs> made business like and normal and it turned into a giant the the, the building trade union decided to make us you know they're to try the prime, exam, the, the prime example of you did know, you get a rat in front oh my, oh my did we god. get a rat oh my god that doesn't even begin to describe it we, we, we got had a, we had we had, we had a we had a we had a five-year war with the building trade unions that like they were extremely corrupt violent they were did a lot of illegal things there was um the a lot of a lot of people it's now over a lot of people went to jail because of this it's pretty oh, crazy yeah. not on our side like we had like you know attempted arson att you know destruction of property vandalism assaults crazy things and the building trade unions have been doing this sort of under the in the in the shadow of darkness for years and then the iron workers in Philadelphia were the building trade. This is 10 years ago now, the building trade union like muscle. So they were going to torch a Quaker meeting house that was being built open shop in like suburban Philadelphia. I am not even making this up. You can just like a, a, like a religious, a religious facility, a, a Quaker. Right. So the ATF, a, the ATF yeah. and the FBI had infiltrated the, the iron workers union and swept them all up, half of them at this property. And where they were, they, As they were there trying to lay this church on fire, like down, literally, the, like the muscle. And then they arrested the leadership in pre dawn raids at their homes. I swear to God, oh you can't God. even make this up. We wrote You're just well, a we, couple we, of guys we, just trying to get a deal done, and like they should, they should have just given to the union if they were reasonable, but <laughs> they should have yeah. left us alone, would have been a lot better. And, and then, you know. That was that was something that no one I think I knew we knew had ever been through. And so like now, uh, maybe it wasn't a five year fight, but now you know, fight. for at least five or six years, we've had a really good relationship with them because they've all got because leadership. that generation of union leadership, that generation well, of union leadership all went to jail. So yeah, the union leadership is a lot better. Yeah, I think that's that's for yeah. I also feel like I don't know how you guys feel about this is at the end of the day. If you get if you can have an open conversation with someone and you're providing them jobs, you yeah. can get there. But if you can't have the conversation, it leads to these horrible things. So, you know, what we found of in course. Los Angeles and other cities we're in is, you know, we want to be union friendly. We always want to sure. be. But give us the reasons why we, we have to do it that way. And if you tell me I have to use a trade or I have to fly people in from New York to do something, that doesn't that, that doesn't work. And. We've been pretty successful over the years with those kind of dialogues, but you know we haven't had the, the days of, of that stuff in Los Angeles was about a hundred years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Philadelphia was about ninety years before behind Los Angeles, and I don't know there, if there's any other cities like this place was you know ten years ago. Yeah. So that was just a, a small chapter, and now we're good friends with all of them. So, so how did it? How did you go from doing that uh, the the concrete eleven story? To the one from LNR, I mean, how did you jump into that if you were having all these sub? Uh, the, those issues hadn't started yet. Oh, those okay. labor yeah. issues hadn't started. Actually, the, the LNR one we was just a kept bit, going the whole time. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, the LNR one was was a little bit simpler. Um, it, was, it was an operating apartment building. Um, we uh, kept it full at first. We emptied out one tower progressively. Started renovating and. It was just a, a faster, simpler renovation because there were already walls. We left a lot of the demising walls in place, um, moved kitchens and bathrooms some, but it was it was because it was an existing apartment building, it wasn't a full adaptive reuse. Um, and we kept it operating the entire time. It was there was always a functioning lobby, even when it was, you know, two-thirds vacant and, and, and total yeah. and total construction site. Um, so that and, and because that was in the suburbs, um, just unions didn't bother us. So that just kind of kept flying. They, they kind of did, but only- They kind of did. I mean, project. they would, they would like, our office was there, so they would follow us there. It was in Philadelphia County, but a suburban-like location yeah. where people have yards and things of that nature. Right. And and so that project um, was simpler. It was a lot of construction, but our total basis on that project was around 
a little less than three yeah. times the total project cost, including the purchase price, was, was around nine, three nine. times the purchase price. And yeah. on the Gold Text project, it was, um, you know, nine eight, times eight, the purchase price. Eight, 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 nine, included, nine. Right. So it's just, it was much, they were both development oriented and, and Rittenhouse Hill was more total construction dollars, but the building was much, much larger. Yeah. So then we just kept do we just kept doing that. We this like union issue is sort of percolating and boiling over in the background, but we just figured like we'll just outlast them. It'll be fine. And so we bought then a, a, one other larger version of each of those things. So we went from having I don't know twenty million dollars of assets from the first five projects that Mike mentioned or 30 million at cost at the, at the beginning of 2010 to by the end of 2012 12. owning assets with a total project cost of like $600 million. So that was kind of, that was kind of interesting. Um, of course it wasn't all financed to completion by the end of 2012, but we, 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 we put one foot in front of the other and just did it. Yeah. Um, so and then we so as you, when you look back now over the last eleven years or so, um, it, it, would you say that the deals and the things you've done have been very linear up, or has life gotten twists and turns and you went and took a smaller project that you didn't really expect, but we did it, or is it you know when did you make that move to ground up? I mean that's a big move in anybody's sure. career. Sure. Sure. We, so we had a slight. We had a we had a branch. That we kind of cut off, but for the most part, it's been consistent. Right. Go ahead. So, so, so those deals coming out of the GFC were those those investments were at such advantaged bases. I think this happened to a, a, a few people, some other friends of mine, some other people probably we all know. You thought like, if I can do that, I can do. You know, the market's going up like crazy, and maybe it wasn't going up like crazy, but the world was just better than it had been. So in like 13, in like 14 and 15, we were, there were no, there was not a lot of thematic distress at that point anymore. And so there was, there were just under, there were a lot of underinvested crappy buildings because there'd been a, there'd been a credit bust. And so there were, you know, three years of trades didn't happen basically from 2008 to 2011. It kind of like if somebody had an old building they were waiting for the right time to sell it. And so we were buying cash flowing value add apartment deals that we had a thesis that, you know, because we were good at development, that would be easy. But like the margins on those things aren't the same. There's no margin for error. And right, development yeah. allows, you know, large margin for profit, lar large ish margin for error. So um, we, 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 we bought a couple hundred million dollars of that kind of stuff like um infill 1920s apartment buildings and like fix it up a little bit do the lobby make sure the elevators are working well upgrade some units prove it out sell it to the next investor and yeah. that didn't really work it, 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 it worked for even, a little bit and then it didn't yeah right we, we raised a little fund around it and then everything was really good except for this one investment and that made us realize a couple things we don't want to be in the fund business and we don't want to be in the value add business so we got out of that. So then at the same time, we were considering doing ground up. We got involved in a project we still own, at, um, I'd say around the end of 14, to partner with a, another developer who was, also a build, who was also a general contractor. He didn't intend to own this building to co-develop a building and buy him out at completion ground up in Northern New Jersey, which was a market we thought was really interesting on the Hudson River facing Manhattan. And, um, we were, we we did this project and we the, our part effectively our partner who you know we have maintained a good relationship with was building it and he was like you know like a little bit of an inefficient builder but it was it was fine and he had it looked so much easier than gut renovating old buildings to build ground up we were just like we were just sort of like we this is definitely what we should be doing so you know at that point i think we made a hard pivot into deciding we were going to have kind of a regular way large scale yeah. um d ground up development business and and try to do bigger just do bigger ground up projects and do less projects because the one thing you heard me mention which i didn't articulate but i think a lot of people sort of 
you know, they have some early success and then they find themselves and, and, you know, maybe a cycle favors them and they've got some good capital or just things line up. And then you wind up doing a lot of deals and you're just doing deals and, and are you doing deals? Or are you making money? And no one ever thinks they're doing a lot of deals, but not making money when that's happening to them. But then you look back on that and you're like, wait, did all this work? Like it, the investors paid all this in fees. They got their money back and like a little bit. And we, this plan like didn't work. We spent all this time on this. There was no promote this, like, you know, buy a piece of land and it's got basic zoning or enter into a joint venture with a landowner, pay for the pre-development, buy the land and don't bring in any investor money until you get a construction loan. This seems like an easier way to live. Yeah. Like it's just like you, you can plan that out. There's generally land everywhere, especially if you're operating in a couple markets, there's always yeah. a site with a difficult owner who, you know, if you're a motivated entrepreneur, you can make a deal with them to be their development partner or get, you know, get reasonable terms to buy it. And so that was the focus of the business. We've got, like I said, a couple thousand units vertical right now, like two, just about 2000 across, did, across a couple of projects. Did you end up bringing along some equity who would be there, reliable equity, so you weren't funding everything out of your own pocket or? Um, we kind of, we kind of, we did, but what we, what 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 we did, we, and I know, yeah. Well, I, I would say we 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 stretched to fund out of our own pocket, and a lot for of for as long as we to, could, for as long as we could to have can to maintain control. control. Yeah. Right. So, so so I know there's a lot of younger people who listen to this, and um, it's interesting. It, it and like there's no way to get capital that you don't have, but as soon as you can get in a position to take a develop a ground up development project or something that you can tie up with an option for a long time and take the most risk out of it possible as possible. And you don't have to ask outside equity anything except, do you want to invest in this thing? When I close a construction loan, you don't need consent over the budget because by virtue of funding, you'll have consented. You don't need consent over the plan, the bit, nothing. It's all, I'm, I'm presenting this to you, yes or no. When, when we got to that point, we we were just striving to get to that point to have balance sheet capital to do that. And then sometimes you needed more equity to close a construction loan. And sometimes the it's still a better the, position on the negotiating table, even if you need more. Well, equity. the other position, if you don't have the money to do any of that, you don't really have much of a negotiating position. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so what yes. I found it, interesting about what you just said relating it to younger people, if people ask me all the time, how do I get in the business? especially if they're apartment broker, and every apartment broker I know wants to be an apartment developer. I'm always like, why don't you befriend that person? And, and if they have the extra land or it, you know, it's a demo and let, and go and get entitlements and then say, Hey, well, I'll bring the equity. Cause once you have the entitlements, once you get the construction loan and it's a big step for people. And it sounds like, well, for you and I know in my career too, you have to live it a little bit to understand why the position you guys are in and the one that makes the most sense for yeah. your career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to just start. When we, were, when we were younger and didn't really have the money, and we had to kind of, you know, act like, "Hey, we're going to do this thirty million dollar project," but we don't really have very much to put on ourselves. We, just, we would just, you know, you, you have to create the momentum. You have to make one side think, build it confident. It's come off as confident that you're going to show up with the money, and then separately, you have to go get the money. I mean, you have to do. You just have to. You just have to start. Let me ask you. So you you built up quite a, quite a track record. You're between Jersey, I, I think you're in the, the DC area as well as obviously you've built a strong track record in the Philly area. What would you say heading into 2020? You know where you saw your business going one way, and then COVID hits. Did it force you to transition your business? Could you just play through it? You know what what effect did COVID March? And I was in. New York, the day New Rochelle shut down. And I felt as in the office business, like my world's about to really get ugly. Did you guys feel stuff like that in, in, in the apartment side or how do, what do you think? So when the fundamentals of apartment leasing got hideous for about five months, like there were, no one was renewing. If, you, if your average occupancy in the coastal markets, you know, effectively just frictional vacancy or five, 6%, whatever, just the natural move in, move out cycle. Like you don't have sitting inventory. We got to like 
67 to 68%, which is insane in the apartment world. And, you know, the yields aren't as high. So you, you get into carrying the property, you know, much more quickly. Like in apartments, if you can build in our markets to, well, forget about now, in 2020, if you could find a good project to build, you know, ground up or adaptive reuse, low sixes, that was a great project, right? Uh, and commercial has, I'd say, you know, a, a higher spread, at least 150 basis points for the same thing in, you know, office or, or then industrial. So in residential, that those that it, 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 you hurt for a while, the market came back. We had um, we had a lender go out of business because they were so levered. Never yeah. happened to us before. Yeah, we had a lender call us, and they had we had a construction loan, and the lender, the lender owned um, um, the lender owned mortgage securities that were levered in an open-ended fund, in a hedge fund structure. And they were also making whole loans out of it, meaning, so they had, they got a margin call and yeah. they had investors needing to get out of the fund. So it was like, just not a good situation for them. They called us and they said, you know, um, we, their exact words were, we're trying to manage our liquidity. Like this is like on March 14th, the world hadn't even closed. So I get this, we're trying to manage our liquidity. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm going to go through it quickly because Chris, I mean, you could imagine how the conversation went. They said, so they had a date where we had to fully, fought, they had a date that was that July where we had to fully draw the construction loan or they were going to force fund it. That, and they got to, we had to start paying interest on money we didn't yet need to use, right? That sometimes you agree to deals like that because on, on balance, it's it's probably fine to agree because you got a, a bunch of other terms you wanted in the loan. So we did that. And then they're like, oh, well, we want to help you and not force fund by July and stretch it. I said, no, no stretching it out. I want you to force fund now. And it was crazy because they didn't say, you know, we want to talk through attorneys. Everyone agree not to waive def assert defenses, whatever. So because this loan was money good, they had to sell it because every, nothing else they could sell was, yeah. um, was, was financeable. So the world started to come back. They put our loan on the market with a pool of other loans. Uh, I'm not sure if there were any other bids on it, but we bought it back at, you know, a, a disc. You never buy your own debt back, not at a discount. Otherwise, like you just pay it off with another loan. Yeah. So we did that. And that was the, that was definitely like the only time we've ever paid a loan off at a discount. And, you know, the lender was going to, was not going to be able to continue to fund it. So I don't think we did anything wrong. And no, yeah, no, they were in their story. situation. So that was, that was actually absolutely uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done as, as a, as a developer, just like getting, lining all that up. Yeah over zoom right because people were, were not in the office yet um other than that supply i don't know mike how else did COVID hurt our business in unique and entertaining ways <laughs> i mean not supply chain issues I mean, yeah 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 occupancy was what bounced back shortly i mean sure there were some supply chain issues but they weren't that major you know we had to pay a little bit extra for insulation and things like that I mean, generally, the supply chain issues, I think, affected small builders much more, not not large builders who were, you know, place a PO, you know, two years ahead of what the time you need, you, you need, you know, you need the last delivery by. It was it was really the COD market, you know, going going to pick up yeah. materials every week that was that was much more effective. So, I mean, you know, sh shipping shipping companies were gouging certainly for a while, but, you know, all that stuff was relatively frictional cost wise probably you know less than five percent but what about uh, part, did you guys get hit with all the tenant protection laws and you can't you can't evict people and we're still the city it's, council in los angeles is still even though the state of california has said COVID emergency powers are over they still have these powers to prevent um people from being evicted that are ridiculous i mean the landlord has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there's a family living there that shouldn't be, or, you know, they've damaged the apartment, but you don't get access to the apartment. The rules are still pretty onerous here in Los Angeles County. Is that not been the case in your markets? Um, the rules, the rules were relatively onerous, but for the most part, we found, you know, our, our apartments are generally top of the market and that the residents have high credit quality. So 
for the most part, we found we didn't have big issues because you can still, um, you know, for them, you, you can still collect and, and people don't want their credit damaged. Um, yeah. We did see in some places, uh, North Jersey, for instance, just had definitely um, the laws were, were pretty permissive, but really it just, for whatever reason, a higher percentage of people who were just intent on taking advantage of the law and staying for longer without paying. Um, but I mean, in general, I, I would say that, you know, co collections and evictions have gone up as a, as a person. I mean, if it used to be used to assume, you know, 30 basis point collection loss, you know, 50 basis point collection loss, something like that. Now it's maybe double that um, since mm -hmm. the pandemic. And that's kind of a continuing thing. It, it, um, in, in the class A space. Because yeah. we, in the class yeah. A space. Yeah. I, I was going to say, uh, Matt, you may have, because we've been at conferences together over the years. Uh, I have a friend, Mark Sanders, out of Miami, who mm -hmm. owns a bunch of stuff out here. And I was asking him, um, because I would say he owns A, and then he also owns kind of C+. Plus, and he said, you'd be amazed that C plus was really good in paying because this was their family home. And this was, sure. their, he said, the A's were really good. It's when I went in, kind of uh, let in the millennials. And I want, I don't want to have him have the uh, the millennials and Gen Zs who didn't really realize that their credit would be destroyed. Well, they the just didn't the most know. Difficult. And I think now they realize their credit's destroyed and they can't go rent an A apartment anymore. Um, we have... We, we have Penn in Philadelphia, so maybe a lot of our millennials went to Penn and they realized that. I don't know, I'm just kidding. I don't. I'm not really sure. We didn't really have that. We were thinking. We didn't. We didn't think it was going to happen because we're very stringent on our credit screening, and yeah, we just we got lucky in that regard. But I've heard um, that 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 has happened more than you'd think it would happen to people who are you know otherwise. Uh, you know, in a position to pay college educated with good credit. Yeah. Well, kind of let, interesting. Let me ask you this, because everybody, you know, we don't know what's happening with interest rates. It seems like they're going to continue to go up. We're not oh, quite yeah. sure where the, uh, uh, Mike, I saw you, was it your daughter before? So I, I got to yeah. ask, who, who's sitting on your lap now? This is this is John. Hey, John. He's too. I like the, <laughs> I like the eye mask. <laughs> the... Um, but you know we don't know where interest rates are going. That we don't know if we're in a recession. We're not going to be in a recession. Well, how are you all looking at the future in terms of rental growth and risk and and that kind of stuff? I mean, in 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 there's the near term and the long term. In the near term, we're not really projecting a ton of rental growth this year, um, just because there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's just this the kind of the smarter thing to do versus projecting a good amount of rental growth. Um, in the long term, I mean. The country and, you know, we operate in, in, you know, top 10 cities, the country and all the kind of dense, big cities that we operate in are generally massively underhoused. And, um, you know, we think the housing business in general is there's a lot of runway. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of fundamental demand in the markets that we're in. So, so in terms of, yeah, in terms of rates, I mean, guessing interest rates, uh, one of one of my investors is you know we 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 have a property that is on a floating rate loan and we're not excited about it so we're sending the annual budget and one of the investors it's an older guy very very like you know wildly wealthy you know and sent just responds to me with an email guessing trying to guess interest rates is foolish that was the whole email that's like <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, so. you know, it is foolish to try to guess rates no one knows where they're going to go or something it's a non sequitur i was like well yes no one knows where they're going to go so um i think that i think that for the foreseeable future you have to assume that we're in a bit of a credit crunch not a crisis but you know the market looked like the financing markets looked like they were getting better and then a month ago they just yeah like literally a month ago, they just got, became worse and worse. And, you know, I think credit spreads are very volatile. So we're, we're taking a view of, we're absolutely interested in investing in assets. We want to, you know, right now we want to be doing office to multifamily conversions, but we'll, we'll also opportunistically buy land. We think there's a lot of lenders who would like to sell some office buildings that they've, you know, maybe taken back and that's you know an opportunity for us but when we think about price 
right? Really two things. One, either the lender has to, the lender, if, if, the, if the asset is coming through a lender, which is where these are coming from now, they have to either, they have to give us such attractive seller financing that we get them out whole, right? Then they no longer have an impaired loan. That's one avenue, but a lot of lenders aren't, in a, just, I don't think they're in a position to do that. And unfortunately, you know, there's going to have to be price discovery. And when we think about price discovery and what we have to pay for something that was didn't work as what it used to be, and now we're going to turn it into something else, we kind of value, we, we need to make, we need to make nearly an equity return on a hundred percent of the acquisition price. Like we have to assume all that there is in the world, whether there's financing or it's our capital or it's investors capital or some combination thereof, it's 10 to 12% money. And so everything's got to kind of work with 10 to 12% money and maybe a 9% exactly construction right. loan. Exactly so, right. So that's- well, We get the question here in downtown LA all the time. I'm like, you know why it worked? The adaptive reuse in the historic buildings from the free World War II, why it worked is because we had the 94 earthquake that red tagged all the buildings. So when people sold them, they literally were selling them for the value of the land. Right. And then you could put all the construction costs. I don't see any conversion of office in downtown LA or in Los Angeles happening until the price for the office building comes down to even less than maybe what the land would be worth because you got to go through the conversion. And so that, that, I, I just 100%. don't see it happening. Most most of these old structures have negative value. Well, so yeah. different markets around the country have are in different stages of that, and then they all have different zoning. So if we're talking about downtowns, you know, zonings zoning is either it's either one of two things. It's like almost impossible. Like I perceive zoning to be in certain parts of California and in New York yeah. City, where they haven't figured out how to pass the zoning at the state level to allow multifamily to be converted or you have prescriptive by right zoning and it's relatively easy. So if you have if you have a place with prescriptive by right zoning which certain parts of downtown LA do, right? They, they have that and you have a building that can be sold free and clear and um, and the fundamentals of the office leasing market were bad before covid, which I'm not saying is this case in LA. Those things are lining up for those places to start seeing trades. Washington, D.C. has a lot of opportunity. Philadelphia, I think, ha is starting to see more opportunity. Houston, I think there's some really good opportunities there. But New York, the prices of these buildings were so high. Forget about the zoning. New York is not seeing a lot. Well, I'd say the local governments also have to decide they're not going to make this an income stream for themselves. They want to promote development, cut all the costs of getting permits, cut the time for permits. That'll then you'll get it. I mean, I, if, if those things happen here, if they take the same approach they did, it only took them from '94 to '07 to create the laws that allowed the adaptive reuse. Um, if they do that, then I'll, then you could see some of the office building switch. But as long as you're going to keep everything in place, I think you're you're more likely to buy office buildings at seventy dollars a foot and keep them office buildings than you are buying them at you know seeing them go down to twenty dollars a foot and switch it to residential. I mean, the, the, it's really big. So I, you know, I, I personally think the best thing is create the incentives to scrap, scrap a lot of these buildings and do new ground up development, as opposed to trying to adaptively reuse a 1965 office building. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we we think there's a lot of scrapes that are in yeah. that bag. It doesn't match as well though with our ESG affinity that your group and my group has, because it does, building something from scratch is harder on the environment, but. Ultimately, you end up with a better product. Mm, yeah, I, I think I think we're um we're it's definitely going to be an interesting year um, in in the markets. I mean, refinancing is not uh, readily available right now. Yeah, there's trades happening, which I find interesting, and there's 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 activity. It's, it does not feel to me like it did in 2010. Uh, so I don't, and, and there's a lot of good things happening in the economy, but until we just need a little bit more price. I think you said at the beginning, the best, we need some more, we need these rumored trades to be trades. So then we have a floor and then we can see where we're going to go from there. So, well, let me, I've, I've had both of you on here and I haven't asked you yet at all, even though Mike, we've watched your children get involved. How do you guys run a business together? All the things you're going on. And then how do you guys work your personal time and all? And I know, 
Matt, I know you decently well enough to know that you're not as uh, the, the work-life balance guy who's going to go off and uh, uh, for a retreat for three months. How do, you, how do you guys? How do you guys keep that work-life balance, but and be active in your families and run your businesses? Um, we actually we live together. We're on the different sides of the same office right now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, well. At, business wise, you know, we like Matt said earlier, we have you know very different responsibilities and areas of the business we focus on for the most part when we come together on certain things. Um, so you know, generally we both like what we do and don't really want to do what the other person does, and so that um works pretty well. And um, how, how do you balance not being a workaholic and having a family, yeah. or or being a workaholic and having a family? <laughs> I mean, I don't just leave the office a little earlier to get yeah, there that's... to read books. I mean, I used to leave it, you know, after seven usually. And now I have to leave, you know, like shortly after six to get home to read, to read, to bedtime. So yeah. I don't know. Right. Right. I don't, um, I think that, I think that um, I probably tell myself at least once a week, like you don't really need to stay. Like, what are you doing? Why are you still sitting at your desk at six o'clock with this big pile of work? Like all these emails that you think you have to respond to, nothing's going to happen if you don't respond until tomorrow morning. And so I, I think, I think, um, you know, it, it's still, still an actively growing business and, you know, maybe growing faster than it has before. I'm not really sure after the past month with interest rates, because, um, it all depends on what big big dependency there. Um, I think it's I think you just have to like say, you know, if you if you if you start a business before you have kids or when your kids are young and you're sort of like not there as much or you're pre or you're preoccupied when you are there, then like at some point maybe you can just. Like it just it it remembering things matter less, and then like doing things with your kids that um, I don't know. I coached my kids and stuff. That's not exactly low pressure, but <laughs> or leisurely, but but I don't know. I just doing finding things that you enjoy doing together. I mean, it's like it's um, how to balance these things is a lot less intuitive than people think. I, I have found. Um, do, you, do you all use any technology? Like we we use we use things obviously uh, um, things like HubSpot for our CRM, and we use Asana for our project management. We use DealPath for following deals. All of this has gotten my life down to really a, a cell phone. I really don't need a computer if I I like it, but I don't need it, and so I can go to practice at three o'clock, coach little league a little bit, and know I'm not out of it. Are you guys? And our team's communicating all the time. Are you guys able to use technology efficiently that way? Not all yeah, emails, yeah. though. You guys aren't emailing each other, are you? <laughs> do we email with each other? Yeah. You guys no. at least text? <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we don't email about anything. Um, a lot of people in our office will send in, like, they send inter-office emails and... I often want to say, like, why are you copying me on this? Like, you've been doing this for 10 years. <laughs> all out, man. We moved to Asana for any inner, inner, because you can't track it, right? You're, if you're not on the email, you don't know what they're doing. If they're, if you're in a project management, you can track it. So, so yeah. sometimes I don't want to be on it and I am on it. And sometimes um, I don't, I actually don't um, communicate. He and I don't communicate over email whatsoever. If it's just between each other, that's not how, unless we're just trying to like finish a work document, like where we have to like send edits back and forth, but we don't, we don't, that's not how we communicate. And I, if I had to communicate with everyone I needed to interact with over email, I would never get anything done. So I've really just said for me, um, so just more transactionally oriented, I get like a piece of paper for my chief of staff on Monday of all the things, you know, she knows that that need to happen that week that she sort of like gathers from everyone else. And then I just tell people if it's really important. And, you know, there's like, the thing I've done is actually tried to minimize email for reading by me. So like, if it's really important, and there's a three page memo, you need to write explaining why something is 
important. It takes three pages. Can you also just call me and tell me what it says before I read it? Because, you know, everybody thinks everything's important. So, so just, just um, pulling away from things that I know I've taught other people to do and forcibly pulling away as much as possible has helped me a lot. Um, and yeah, that's- It's gotta be I, inherent what you're saying is you both have gotten pretty good at delegation. I think so. You have I think to, it's, I mean, it's if you a, have a chief of staff, you're delegating something. And I think that's a that's the hard skill for anybody to learn in life is, I, I said it to this guy in the computer world, I was talking about my life and business. And I was like, I really wanna live my whole life on an iPhone. And he goes, well, then why don't you just make the determination that if you have to do something that's on an iPhone, you have somebody else in your company do it. And like a light bulb went off for me. I was like, that's brilliant. Oh, that's right. Maybe if I can't edit it, the Google doc for my phone, then I shouldn't be, it's, it's not far advanced enough for me to see this yet. That's, so. yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, that's a pretty, that's it. That's definitely, as they say, radical acceptance of, <laughs> uh, you know, a, 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 of a different reality. I, I would like to be able to get there. That's, well, it's, you know, we're, we're both, all three of us are in this changing of the guard. I had lunch today with a mentor of mine and a dear friend, and he was asking us about what, what are, what are our policies? You know, we own all this office. What are our policies about people being in? And, and I said, you know, number one, we require people to be in for meetings that we feel need to be in, in person. We try to set those out on a standard schedule. So people know, um, we like to work Monday through Thursday or kind of in the office for us, but if you're an asset manager, you're out. And I, I gave them this all detailed, you know, and why this works. We got rid of business hours. We got rid of dress codes. So people should come in. <laughs> it's punchline to the whole thing to me was, I still feel comfortable if everybody's in 40 hours a week, nine to five, Monday through Friday. And I'm like, okay, that's not recognizing that technology has come a long way. So, you know, I don't know how you guys view it, but I think we can use technology to make our lives better. We got to be able to communicate and we got to have some in person. I, I mean, I don't, I, how often are you guys in the office? Every day. Yeah. We're, but, we're, I mean, you really look at your every default. day, and then you say, "Well, Fridays, I had to go take the kid to this sports." Yeah, no, no, no. But, but by, by by default, my plan is to go. Yeah. If I have nothing on my calendar, I'm going into the office. I'm not going somewhere. I don't have a family commitment. That's it's, right. It's a, yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's a big deal too. I think is I go in the office because I like to work. I like to get my right. work done. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's harder to do that in other places. But anyway, I'm getting yeah. off you guys more of the apartment side. Let me ask you this. Let me. What is the number one change in technology that you've seen in owning and operating apartments that you think has been a game changer for how you guys do, you know, whether it's for your tenants or how has technology changed the way you own and operate an apartment building? Um, let's think. Well, I would say that, you know, we, we use a lot of technology. We've we were on, we've been on revenue management software before and we are not now. Um, I don't think it's really right for our assets. It's right for some assets in some markets. It's not really right for kind of, generally we find that it's not really right for things that don't have a lot of comps. Um, you know, and, and when you have a commodity product in a market with a lot of similar product, it works pretty well. When you have a real unique product without um, a lot of direct competition, it, you know, it's, it's a lot less value. And it's frankly with the the kind of ham-fisted way to adjust rents, it's a lot better than just having a property manager think about it, but it's not as good as having, you know, somebody who's like a junior principal or asset manager think about it. Um, you, you know, there's, there's you can, you, can, you can definitely be more thoughtful than the software. Um, so that said, um, we, we use it. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, the whole leasing process, you know, there's no paper leases or any paper documentation anymore. I think that um, has saved us a huge amount of just work. Um, you know, it's it's just the, the manpower necessary for that. Um, the way marketing works has totally changed um, in the apartment business. Um, the, our, one of our kind of senior people I hired in... 2009, he had an architecture degree. There are no architecture jobs. I hired him to be a full-time Craigslist poster because that's what <laughs> that's how you market an apartment. You posted all the time on Craigslist. And you had to like copy and paste and and try to pretend like you were somebody else so they didn't block you. And 
and the, the markets like really change. And I think that's that. I think it's a really a big competitive advantage of ours is that a lot of the apartment multifamily management business is not super sophisticated. It doesn't apartment management doesn't attract um, you know a lot of you know Carnegie Mellon graduates and whatnot. And, and so um, you know the marketing mindsets tend to be pretty stale and the way digital marketing works today for other stuff is kind of light years ahead of you know somebody who knows how to buy an apartment guide ad and so for us i think it's been a huge competitive advantage frankly um of we, we you know we were able to hire a really top-notch you know marketing leader from outside of the apartment industry um who really understood um you know that, that the way the way things work in a modern way and it was a great team and I think it remains a big competitive advantage of ours. Well, let me leave you with this one question. We've been going for a while. Um, how afraid are you guys of Adam Newman and Flo? Are they really going to change the entire real estate business like they did the office business, quote unquote? <laughs> well, I thought I Flo think was going to be about as impactful as. What, are you both talking about? What's that? I said, I thought Flo was a personal hygiene product he made. I must have been mistaken. <laughs> I think it's a good way to hide your your billing that you took from all your investors in the office and, and say you're doing something similar in the in the apartment. Well, it was the first mez loan that um what was the venture capital firm that Sequoia and Flow? Oh no, no sorry, Flow. I, no, it's good. It's A Z. A- 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 it's a- Andreessen. A-Z, Horowitz. I'm sorry, A-Z, A-Z, A-Z. I didn't know Andrews and Horowitz was in the apartment mez lending business. Yes, because that was what they did. Boy, if you look at what he put together and and they they released A Z released it. It was it was silly. It was silliness, but you know, because I mean, you know, when I rent an apartment, I really do want to clean my own toilet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. It's uh, it's exactly. like wait, you want to create community, and there's community rooms. There's <laughs> community rooms. <laughs> what if there was a pool where everybody could hang out together? Yes. Yeah, a wild idea. Yeah, yeah. share um, with you. We well, it's happy. great to have you both. Mike, I don't think we've met. I know Matt and I have met over the years, but I don't know if we've met. So it's nice to have you on. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, thanks for being on, both of you. Thanks for having us.